is no ordinary song. We are living in extraordinary times uh, with the pandemic going on around us, but we know that our God is still in charge. My brothers and sisters, from the book of Jonah, uh, this is our fourth lesson that we'll be doing from the book of Jonah, one of the minor prophets. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mattiah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And we want to talk to you again this week from a thought, the reluctant prophet. The reluctant prophet. In chapter 1, we found where Jonah was trying to escape from the presence of God, mm -hmm. doing the exact opposite of what God had called him to do. God caused a strong storm to come up on the ocean. Chapter 2, we find where Jonah has been thrown overboard and God has prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. In chapter 3, we find where uh, Jonah has, his prayer has been answered. Uh, God has delivered Jonah. Jonah is now preaching to the city of Nineveh. He's preaching to the Ninevites. At the close of chapter 3, we find where all of the people of, of Nineveh, all 120,000 of them, repented and turned from their evil ways, and the Lord has spared the city. Now we pick it up in chapter 4 of Jonah. Mm -hmm. And we find in verse 1 of chapter 4, where it says that it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, was this not what I said to you while I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. My brothers and sisters, we find in chapter 4 where Jonah has actually gone out and preached the word of God, but something strange has happened. Has happened. Usually preachers, when they go out and preach the word of God, they're praying that the congregation or the ones that are listening will hear the message, receive the message, and turn or repent from their evil ways. But Jonah wasn't. There was something about the matter that displeased Jonah. So much so that the word says he was exceedingly angry. It was strange because Jonah was upset because of the result of his preaching. Jonah was angry. He was angry because the people of Nineveh repented, turned away from their sinful ways when Jonah wanted God to destroy his enemies. Jonathan Swift, a well-known theologian, wrote these words as he tried to summarize how he believed that Jonah's frame of mind was at that point. Jonathan Swift says, we are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. And some of us are like Jonah. We want God to forgive us, but we want, don't want him to forgive our enemies. Jonah's knew, Jonah knew that God was full of grace and mercy. And this was one of the reasons why Jonah did not want to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. Jonah wasn't afraid that his preaching would be ineffective he was afraid that it would be effective so much so that everyone would repent and God would forgive Jonah himself called on the mercy of God and God's grace when he was in the belly of the great fish but now he resents it when God shows grace and mercy to someone else I have a question for all of us this morning what if God would have treated Jonah the way that Jonah wanted God to treat the people of Nineveh? The repentance and salvation of the people of Nineveh is so painful to Jonah that Jonah asked God to let him die. He would rather die 
than see the people of Nineveh turn from their wicked ways and accept Jesus Christ, or accept God. Next, what Jonah does, Jonah does something like some of us do from time to time when things don't go our way. Jonah started throwing a pity party. But we have to be careful, my brothers and sisters, whenever we throw our pity parties or temper tantrums, because usually whenever you throw a pity party, the only one that shows up to the party is you. Mm -hmm. So Jonah decided he would leave out of the city and he would make a tent on the east side of the city and wait there to see what God would do to the people of Nineveh. Jonah had a seat. God had mercy on Jonah once again. The word says that God prepared a plant to come up overnight and grow over Jonah's head to give him shade during the day. And God prepared a worm the next day to cut the root of the plant and the plant died. Then God prepared a great wind to come from the east out of the desert to blow upon Jonah's head and Jonah felt faint. And once again, Jonah asked God to let him die. My brothers and sisters, you can tell that he's having a pity party. Mm -hmm. He asked God twice in chapter 4 to let him die. If he really wanted to die, why didn't he just die in the belly of the fish? Mm -hmm. But God knew that he was just having a pity party. And isn't it good to know that we're serving a Savior that even in the midst of our pity party, well, well. he still loves each and every one of us. Yes, he does. In the book of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, the Israelites, the Jonas of the world, did not understand what God said to his servant Abram, Abram in the book of Genesis. Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3, it says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land where I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And, all, and in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Even in the book of Genesis, from the very onset of this thing. God said that he was a God of all people. He said that Abraham just wouldn't be a blessing to his children and children's children's children, but he would be a blessing to all of the nations, all of the people of families of the earth. This is something that Jonah just did not understand. In St. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Jesus is on his way to Galilee and he's about to teach his disciples a very valuable lesson to let them know that he's a he's the savior of not just the Jewish nation but he is the savior of the world in John 4 1 through 4 the word says therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John though Jesus himself did not do any baptizing but his disciples, he left Judea again to go to Galilee. That word again means that this is not the first trip that he made to Galilee, but this is the first time that he's going through what they were called enemy territory. He went through the land of Samaria. The Samaritans were a mixed race of people. They hated the Jews and the Jews hated them. But the word says that he needed to go through Samaria. Why? Again, to teach his disciples a lesson. He had an appointment with a lady at the well, and he wanted them to understand that he is the savior of not only the Jews, but the savior of the Samaritans and each and every one of us, everyone that would call on the name of the Lord. This is something Jonah failed to understand. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, Jonah and all of the Jonas of the world need to listen at these verses as they speak to us. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 says, After these things, after the sealing of the 144,000, John says, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number. No earthly mathematician could count all of these people. He says of all nations, 
tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, representing purity and righteousness, with palm branches in their hands, representing victory. They have overcome by the blood of the Lamb, palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to God. Salvation is not of man, but salvation is of the Lord, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels round about the, uh, about the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. They didn't have their worship mixed up. Uh -huh. They were not worshiping angels. They were not worshiping men, but they were worshiping God. All nations, all tribes, all peoples and tongues. There were just not white or Caucasians there. There was not just a blacks there. There was not just Koreans or Filipinos, but there was there were represented there was represent, uh, representation rather from all the different nations of the world. So God is a God of all people because He created the human race. In Luke chapter nine, verses fifty-four through fifty-six, Jesus has sent His disciples out uh, before Him because He's on His way now to Jerusalem. He enters, his disciples enters into a Samaritan village and the people refuse to accept Jesus. And this is what James and John declared, Luke 9, 54 through 56. And when his disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to rain down or call down fire from heaven to destroy these people like Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said to them, you do not know what manner of spirit that is in you. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus is here. He came in the person of the Holy, he came, in the, he came as God's Son, rather, to save our souls. He left and went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit might dwell within all of us who are believers, and therefore, if the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, the word declares that we can do all things because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And I like how Peter summarized this thing to let the Jewish nation know that God is not just for the Jews only, but for all mankind. Second Peter chapter three, verses eight and nine states, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, no, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has put up with us, and he tolerates a lot of stuff from us, because it's his desire that none of us should die and go to a devil's hell. But he wants each and every one of us to be with him, his son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of the holy angels in glory for all eternity. It's God's desire that none should perish. Some of us wonder why God is, is putting up and tolerating with some people as long as he has. It's because God doesn't want anyone to die unsaved. When we look at ourselves, when we look at ourselves, mm -hmm. we were not born saved. No, look how long we were outside of the will of God. God was long suffering towards us because he didn't want us to die in our sins. He didn't want to send death angel to catch us with our work undone. Yes, what an awesome God we serve. He's doing it because he doesn't want anyone to die unsaved. Matthew chapter five. Verses 43 through 44, Jesus' sermon on the mount. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Listen to what Jesus said. You shall love your neighbor. Not only love your neighbor, but love your neighbor as yourself. We have to even love our enemies. 
My brothers and sisters, the only way it's possible for us to love someone who hates us is that we have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of us. We can't do it on our own. We need someone to come alongside and help us yes, sir. in our weaknesses because my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, we're living in times such, in the times in which we are now living in, we need someone on the inside, someone who's stronger than we are to help us along this journey. And that's why Jesus Christ sent, to, sent the Holy Spirit to help enable us to make it through these times in which we are now living. In the book of 2 Kings, you'll find the story there of Elisha. The Samaritans, again, hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. Elisha finds a band of Samaritans that were raiding Israel, causing all kind of havoc. Elijah prays that the Lord would cause physical blindness to come upon them. God answers his prayer and causes blindness to come upon these raiders. Elijah then leads them into the land of Israel. Elijah prays again that God would open their eyes and take away the blindness, and God does so. 2 Kings 6, 21 through 23, it says, Now when the king of Israel saw them, that is the band of marauders, uh, the Samaritans, he said to Elijah, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But Elijah answered and said, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with the sword and with your bow? Of course not. You may uh, enslave them, but you're not going to kill them. He said, Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then the king of Israel, he just didn't throw something together haphazardly. The word says, then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away to their master. That latter clause of that 23rd verse says, so the band of Syrians radio, raiders came no more into the land of Israel. The word says, when your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsty, give him something to drink. Israel did this to their enemies, and look at what happened. Their enemies, once again, did not enter into the land of Israel anymore. They showed kindness, and kindness was extended to them. In Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22, it says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so, for so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The Lord will reward you. We, it all boils down to treating people the way that you want them to treat you. Romans chapter 12, and I love this. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. It says, repay no one evil for evil. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, and I have said it, I'm going to get even with them if it's the last thing I do. My brothers and sisters, if we aren't careful, it may be the last thing uh -huh. that you do. Uh -huh. The word says, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, if it is possible. Now, it's harder to love some folk than others. But again, the word says, through and by the Holy Spirit, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome evil with, do not be overcome rather by evil, but overcome evil with good. My brothers and sisters, don't try to take matters into your own hands, but give it to the Lord and watch the Lord work it out for you. Matthew 7 and verse 12, the Amplified Version says, So then, whatever you desire that others would do to you, even so do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Two more verses and I'm finished. Jonah 
and all of us can learn from this. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Mm -hmm. Paul says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They didn't have the spiritual knowledge to understand that God is a God of all people, not just for them only. Some of us want God to just bless our families, but we're supposed to be praying that God's blessing will be upon each and every one of us. And finally, Romans chapter 12. Finally, Romans 12, uh, Romans chapter 10, rather, verses 12 and 13. For there is no distinction, Jonah, and for all the Jonas of the world, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord, mm -hmm. not another. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that great news? Oh, yeah. It does not matter. It does not matter what family you come from, what race you belong to. The word says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is no difference between us today. There is no difference. God is the same God overall. He is the same Lord overall. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. My brothers and sisters, if you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sins, now is the time to get to know him. What an awesome God we serve. Jonah found out the hard way and didn't want anyone else to be saved but he and his people. But God is for each and every one of us. Whosoever, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ and made him your choice, you're in that number. But he says you can come out of that whosoever by accepting his son. And the promise is that if you accept him, you shall be saved. Will you come and give one of the ministers your hands? But be sure and very sure that you give your heart to the Lord. The praise team is going to come once again. And they're going to close us out. Let's give them a hand. Hope those home. Sometimes that's all we got to say. Y'all help me. Thank you.